Alors, pour la cinquième conférence du Forum des sciences cognitives 2016, nous avons docteur Aldo Faisal qui est venu de Londres. Donc, monsieur Aldo Faisal est en maître de conférence et en chercheur en neurotechnologie dans le département de biotechnologie à Imperial College London. Aujourd'hui, dans cette conférence Neuroscience in the World, Dr. Faisal va nous montrer comment la variabilité et le bruit dans le cerveau sont des, sont des ingrédients clés pour comprendre et prédire le comportement, le, le comportement humain. Hello and welcome. For this talk, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Aldo Faisal, a very special guest from London. Dr. Faisal is a senior lecturer in neurotechnology, jointly at the Department of Engineering and the Department of Computing at Imperial College London. Uh, today in his talk, Neuroscience in the Wild, Dr. Faisal will give us his insights on how variability and noise in the brain are key ingredients to understanding and predicting human behavior, and how the control of behavior in the wild is predictably different ways than what we measure in the lab. I personally have been waiting for this talk for weeks, so I ask you to give Dr. Faisal your full attention and help me wel welcoming him to the stage. Hello and thank you, and my apologies for not being able to speak in French, but I think we will all enjoy it a lot more if I speak in English. Um, I'm a neuroscientist who happens to be also an engineer, and so the way we approach neuroscience has over the past few years evolved a bit differently from what you would typically expect in a cognitive neuroscience context. Um, and so what I would confront you with is this quote that I very much enjoy, um, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. And this is typically used to criticize biological descriptive science. And um, I will actually show you today only my stamp collection and none of my physics. Okay. So in my lab, we work on neurotechnology. And neurotechnology is to us the fusion of neuroscience and engineering, using engineering to better understand the brain but then using the brain's understanding of how to solve problems to make better engineering solutions. And this can be really divided into three different levels of organization uh, that were postulated by David Marr uh, some 35 years ago. So David Marr suggested that any problem that has to do with problem solving can be decomposed into three levels, something that we call the solution strategy, how should, I do a, how should I approach a problem? We call this the computational level. Then there's a question about what calculation in representations do you need to find that solution? That's the algorithmic level. And then at the bottom, there's a question about how do I implement these calculations and these representations in hardware, if you're building robots or computers, or in wetware, if you want to understand how the brain is designed. And what's really important for us is that these first two levels are ignorant of what the hardware that sits below here is, whether it's cells or computer chips. And we can ask a lot of important questions about what the brain does by just operating at this level. And then we have the advantage that we can use a lot of the tools and the mathematics that comes from engineering to look at uh, behavior and the brain in a quantitative manner. And I want to start with you with an example of what we've been doing over the past three years. And it's a very unusual experiment. Um, and so here we have done the following thing. We've collaborated with archaeologists that are interested in the most fundamental human behavior that makes us human. The making of flintstone tools in the Stone Ages. And what we've developed with them is we try to understand, can we find a scientific understanding of the cognitive and neural constraints that humans had to evolve, setting us apart from our primate ancestors to be able to manufacture tools. And there are multiple ways you can do that. So here you see data that we developed uh, a method. So instead of using actual flint stone, so this technology here, we use a ceramic that has the same mechanical properties. And this allows us to do repeated identical trials, something that is the standard protocol in, in any experimental psychology experiment you will have experienced. And what you see here is the first person view in this circle 
the funny circle here is actually the eye tracking attention of the subject. And if you observe this, then over 10, 20 minutes, you will observe that the manufacturer here who uses original techniques from the Stone Ages can reproduce a Flintstone tool axe as you will find in excavations in Ethiopia, for example. Okay? So that's a highly unconstrained experiment. There's somebody just doing something. And so part of my colleagues uh, uh, have then done basically neuroimaging on these subjects. So we took nine undergraduate students from Exeter University and we trained them over a period of three years to reproduce these Flintstone tool axes. And it takes roughly three years to manufacture them. And we found changes in brain structure. And my neuroimaging colleagues were very happy and they said, okay, we have understood the problem, thank you very much, goodbye. And I as a neuroscientist was wondering, okay, so what have I actually understood about this? How can I understand better what's going on when you're learning to do these type of technologies and what limitations and constraints does my brain have to uh, be able to produce these type of tools? And so we embarked really uh, some six years ago when I set up my lab in London uh, about ways of trying to understand this unconstrained behavior because it's the unconstrained behavior where we act in daily life, where evolutionary pressures actually operate not in some artificial restricted lab settings. So what we really want to do, we want to understand the perception action loop, so how information that gets processed from our senses, learning goes on, and then we generate some form of motor action. This loop we want to understand. And we don't feel that we can separate this loop. We cannot just look at perception and we cannot just look at action. We have to look at it in a closed fashion because that's how things operate actually in the brain. So let me interrupt you briefly here with a question. How many organisms do you know that have a brain but cannot move? Hands up, if you know one organism at least that has a brain but cannot move. How many organisms do you know that don't have a brain but can move? Okay, so this is not a proof of anything, but I should suggest to you that movement and having a brain is sort of very tightly linked. And there's very little need to have a brain if you cannot move and change the world. So this means I'm what we call a motor chauvinist. I believe that movement and motor actions are very important, but it also means that I can say something about what's going on inside my brain based upon the movements that you can observe me do. And really we're interested in looking at this at a cognitive level, so where we specify tasks like having a coffee by using verbs, go to the coffee machine, grab the cup, press the button. At the same time, our brain actually has to generate action potentials that you can see here, for example, that record the activity with which the brain drives individual muscles. And these are two very different domains, but clearly somehow these two domains need to be linked, and we want to understand how these two are linked. And so, while a part of my lab works on classic, you know, experimental psychology experiments, the other half of the lab has basically gone off in a different direction, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So, typical in the lab experiments versus what we call in the wild experiments, experiments that are completely unconstrained. Let me give you an example of that. So, if you look, for example, at the human hand, most textbooks will tell you that the two most important movements of the hand are the precision pincer grip and the power grasp. And that has been so, and if you follow the literature, uh, you end up in 1730, that there's some doctor in the countryside of England who said, these are the two most important hand movements. And everyone since then has cited this paper going back all the way. But we actually wondered, is it actually true that this and this are the two most important hand movement if we've never measured that. And if you start thinking about that, you realize something very bizarre, that in the 21st century, we know the human genome, we know the structure of proteins that this genome encodes, we know the connectivity of neurons that are ultimately modified, modulated by protein-protein interactions, but we know very little about daily human life behavior. And so we started a project that we call the Human Ethome Project, Etho from ethology, 
that aims at studying behavior in the same systematic way we've done it for other areas of research, genomics, proteomics, connectomics. And so what we did is, with a very simple start, we put on uh, these wearable cyber gloves that measure every single joint of the hand, and we wore them for a whole day. And many people did that. And at the end of a long day, we looked at the data, and we found that the precision pincer grip was not used a single time. So one of the two most fundamental behaviors, as by some textbook, are actually not occurring. And the only time we ob observed a pincer-like grip was when people were operating on their iPad. Okay? So, so something is fundamentally wrong about what we understand about behavior. And so this is really work uh, led by three uh, team members, Andreas, Konstantinos, and William in the lab. And we basically set out to systematically study science and doing science in the wild. So we converted part of the lab into a studio. So we had a kitchen, we had an office space and a bedroom. And people came in the start of the morning and were put on uh, various tracking equipment and they lived the whole day in this lab. And we did this for many people and we developed various technologies to do that. So we recorded all their eye movements and the scene. We recorded all their uh, skeletal movements and we recorded roughly 20 joints of each hand. So in total, 45 degrees of freedom of the human body, 20 degrees of freedom per hand, all eye movements and what they see and what they hear. And that's a bit of expensive, so then we also developed some technology to drop the cost. Okay, so the next slide, my PowerPoint may crash, so I apologize beforehand. I hope it's going to work. So this is how this database looked like. So in the bottom left, you see the scene camera of uh, our subject uh, having breakfast. On the right, bottom right, you see the instantaneous reconstruction of their finger configuration. On the top right, you see what they're seeing, and this little colorful dot tells us if they're making a saccade, whether they're making a smooth eye movement, whether it's a fixation. And here you see the instantaneous 3D reconstruction of their body together with this colorful vector that shoots out of the hand, of the, of the head, which is actually their gaze vector, so where they're looking in depth. And recorded all this data. And so basically, we get this database that we call the Human Ethome Database. We have scanned 60 subjects, tracking roughly what we estimate 70% of all human sensory input and capturing roughly 70% of all human motor outputs. We're not measuring forces, uh, we're not measuring muscle activities, we're only measuring joint angles. And so in this database, you now have all the movements of the various joints, and it's annotated so we know that they're walking or putting, a, I don't know, marmalade on a, on a toast on things like that. So just to give you a sense, and that's where my computer crashed. <laughs> so let me just restart it. So just to give you a sense, the database is 45 terabytes. 45 terabytes is the equivalent of 4.4 million phone books. Or is every Parisian would give you two phone books, and that's the amount of data on our server at the moment. So what we can do now is a different type of science. We don't need to analyze individual effects. We can just scan the whole database for what you're doing in, in daily life and try to extract some structures. And while my computer is still restarting. Um, so with, ah, there. So to give you a sense of how that looks like, consider a classic eye movement experiment. So you're sitting here on a very high quality iLink 1000 eye tracking system, and I ask you to do various eye movements on that screen, but your head is clamped. So if this is the velocity of your head, and this is the velocity of your eyes in the plane of the rotation of the head, all that you're looking at is something like this. And then if you measure that, you find uh, that there's a lot of activity here and very little up here and very up here. But if you have the free eye movement data where you just live your daily life, you get a full picture where you see where the eyes are indicated. The redder this data is, the more probable you're going to do that movement. You can see that there's a rich structure that correlates your eye movements and your head movements. And this is, of course, 
part of the vestibular ocular reflex just falls out of this data set. But we just don't have that for one joint of the head and one joint of the eye. We have that for all joints of the body. And so we can now do histograms of where do all these joints actually live. And from these reconstructions, we can then work out how often you do this or you do something like that. Now, here comes something that a lot of individualistic people don't like. It turns out that human behavior, if you look at it in the right way, is ridiculously stereotypic. You always execute this, your movements in a similar manner. And you and any of you in the audience and me will move in the same way. So we are, there's a stereotypicity across subjects and within subjects, and it's surprisingly powerful. But it's not a, it's not a stereotypicity that comes out of the uh, joint angles of the body. The stereotypicity comes out of the velocity of the, uh, of the body. And so what I'm showing you here, it's a bit of a complicated picture, and I want to keep it simple is you see here plotted the velocity of the joint in logarithmic units, and here the frequency with which during a normal day uh, you move at that joint's velocity. So for example, this joint here is the up-down movement of the neck, and you can see here a black line in the middle, and the gray area above and below is one standard deviation, not the standard error, across 15 different subjects on the same day. So these are very narrow variability bands. There's a lot of structure. And so what we can do is we can plot this structure. And one way of visualizing that is I can plot here all the joints and here all the joints. And if two joints of the body are highly correlated, I make this very white. And if they're not correlated at all, I make it very black. And so you can see here that there's clearly structure that links our body and joints together, most obviously our knees and our hips are linked simply from the fact that we're walking, but there are also interesting links between joints of the arm and joints of the body that are non-trivial. Um, it's not just this standard walking motion. So one thing we can do is we can apply that, for example, to clinical data. So we have not only scanned 60 healthy people, we've scanned also a large number of various patients suffering from various neurological diseases. And from these, we can basically now extract markers that can reduce the time it takes to detect if a drug works on the brain or not from 12 to 18 months, which is the scale for various clinical measures of disease progression, that's of relevance if you're a neurologist, uh, to something that at the moment operates at under 12 months. So we're trying to push for nine months. And that's very important because a lot of neurological disorders are rare, neglected diseases. And if we can unroll this type of high-resolution, high-throughput behavior monitoring on these patient populations, we can effectively drop the cost of clinical trials by at least a factor of 50%. And I'm going to skip this part because we had a crash. And let me catch up again. So all this study of these correlations of movements in the brain are not just pure, um, they're not just useful in a clinical sense but we can also make sense out of these in a scientific way. So here, I'm showing you the same picture I showed you before, but here I'm also showing you the movements of the joints of the fingers in relation to the movements of the joints of the human body. And so these are all pretty pictures, but what I want you to notice is that there's structure in our fingers and there's structure in our body. And so there could be two reasons why you have this structure that is conserved across subjects. Either because, you know, all the things that we do are so stereotypical that, you know, you always have bottles that look like this, so you will always have a structure of your grasp like that. Or the other reason is that your brain chooses to control your movements in a specific way, and that's why we have designed objects or tools in general to fit how we like to control things with our body. And so, if this latter assumption is true, then there should be some inclination of this correlation structure that we just observe from movements in representations of the brain. And so my colleague, your colleague Jörn Dietrichsen has done exactly that study. So he took seven Tesla high-resolution fMRI imaging from the hand knob of the motor sensory cortex area, 
And he basically did an experiment where he asked subjects to move individual fingers individually and then in pairs. And then he asked, how can I best predict from the two individual finger movements the joint activation of the two fingers? And there are various models. You can look at about the somatosensory inputs to these fingers. You can look at the muscle synergies of these fingers. Or you can just look at the correlation between the joint angles that we have measured. And what we discovered is that the best prediction, uh, this is an R square of 0.9, is achieved if you use the natural correlations of the joints. So this means the way you move during your day is, not surprisingly, reflected in the correlation structure of neural activity in the brain. Now that's useful if you, for example, you want to develop novel prosthetics. So think about this thing here. So this is a type of hand of a cook, very agile, being able to manipulate food with ease. This is a, a, a standard prescribed prosthetic made by a German company, Otto Bock. That's a standard prosthetic that you receive if you're amputee in England. And this is one of the most sophisticated robotic hands currently made. Uh, and um, the interesting thing is you can see how primitive the degrees of motions of these hands are because it's very hard to decode how to move these hands. And the roboticists that develop this hand here will be able to tell you, yeah, we can mechanically build a hand that is like a human hand, but we don't know how to control it. We don't know what the brain behind this control should look like. So what we did is the following thing. We took all the data that we have about the natural hand motions in our data set, and then we asked ourselves, imagine you lose three fingers these three fingers. Can we, just from what the other two fingers do, reconstruct what the full hand should be doing? So you can imagine this can be a very simple prosthetic application. And just by exploiting the predictability and stereotypicity of human hand movements, in our first model, uh, we were able to reconstruct the joint angles of the whole hand with the root mean square errors of six degrees. And just so you know how much six degrees is, it's about that much, my thumb, if you hold it fully stretched out. Okay? So that's not a big error if you think about how wide the operating range of a full hand is. And then we did various improvements on the algorithms to bring it down to an even smaller number. So this means there's a lot of stereotypicity just in the movement. We've not done any myoelectric recordings of the EMG activity. What we then did is record the myoelectric activity, and so in this case, we had somebody operate um, this uh, uh, screwdriver here, and uh, we then de recorded that activity and then reconstructed that on a robotic hand we developed in the lab. And the best way to show you that this works is, if you look here, the, this gray bar here is what we predict the finger movement should be, and the red line here is what the actual finger movement was. Okay? So human behaviors predictable enough if you just look at the correlation structure. And so from this correlation structure, we were then able actually to develop better robotic prosthetic hands. And so this is a project led by Harris in my lab who's developed this new prosthetic hand. And one thing that you will notice is that all these hands have a fully actuatable thumb. So they can freely move around, they can even type on the phone, and I challenge you to show me a robotic hand that can do that at the moment. And we can do that because we have simply mined the structure of how the thumb, moves, the thumb moves in respect to the other fingers. But let's go a bit further. So we started with the question, what are the most important hand movements? So can I give you an answer for that? So what we did is we applied and developed a statistical analysis algorithm that looks for the most frequent patterns that occur in space and time during the movements of your hands. And we basically said, imagine your hand movement is like a language, and your hand makes different symbols of a language. So if I say the words hello, you will hear the sound hello, and somebody may say hello, hello. You will always recognize the hello. There's something invariant in that, although the actual waveform of the sound is slightly different. And we applied that same idea to human movements. And so this is a dictionary-based method that we developed that takes in the input from the joint angles and then gives us a symbolic code of movement. It translates the continuous kinematics of the hand into some abstract symbolic code. 
And so I'm showing you now three words of that symbolic code. And these happen to be also the three most used words. Uh, so for example, like the, he, are, is, she in the English language. And these are the three most frequent ones. And you can see that none of them is a precision pincer grip, not surprisingly. But actually, none of them is also full power grip. It looks actually like there's more subtle structure in the movement of our hands. And so, if this analysis is meaningful and captures something about humans, then it must be invariant to the human. So what we did is the following thing. We extracted these words of hand movements for every person individually. And then we simply compared, is your word of your hands and my word of my hands the same or not? And so each row here is a subject. Each column here is a different word we discovered. So some people have different words than others, but when you see an all green column, it means that all 10 subjects had the same word. And we never pulled the data. So we found an invariance. And we find that roughly 60% of all the words are conserved that we find. And we can then simply plot how many words are you using as time progresses. And in total, we find you have roughly 60 to 65 different hand words. And within the first 20 minutes, you use, you use typically two thirds of all hand, uh, um, hand words. And you can just imagine how many different French words you need, are you using in 20 minutes of speech. And so certain words are appearing very frequently, and then increasingly few and fewer words will, uh, will be necessary. And just to come just for the technical affectionados, we can beat with our form of what we call sparse code uh, existing methods for describing hand movements uh, by a factor of two. So all that I've showed you so far was just based on the analysis of movements of the body, but we've also measured the movements of the eyes. And the eyes are, from a technological perspective, very interesting. First of all, because if you suffer from Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, spinal cord injury, stroke, amputation, or have degradation of the musculoskeletal system due to aging, in all these cases, you can still somehow move your eyes. So the question is, can we measure these eye movements and use them for something useful? So the first thing that we did is we developed our own eye tracking system that can measure not just the direction of eye movements, but also the depth and we were able to drop the cost by a factor of roughly 1,000. And with that, a few years ago, we then demonstrated that paralyzed people can very rapidly learn to play an arcade video game, in this case, the video game Pong, in real time. That's because the latency of our system is under 10 milliseconds, 10 to 15 milliseconds. So I challenge you to find a brain-machine interface technology based on EEG or EMG or even EcoG that can decode intention of the user in under 10 milliseconds. And so what this gives you is an immediate signal that can control a continuous actuator. And what struck us is that you didn't have to think about how to use this actuator. So what we did is the following thing. We put up our eye tracking system to play Pong in these booths. Uh, we put this in a science or exhibition that I organized. We had 5,000 visitors coming to that exhibition. 2,300 people use this system. And the system is fully automated. There's no human interaction. And after 15 seconds of calibration, you play the Pong video game for 60 seconds. And so we found that out of this 2,300 users, 70% were able to play successfully Pong and return balls. That's without training, without assistance. And on average, they managed 8.6 returns of the ball. So I think this just shows if you can decode eye movements in a meaningful manner, then you can actually provide technology that is almost so intuitive to use that there's actually no learning going on. But that's fine for moving a cursor on a screen, but we want to go further. And so what really inhibits eye movement use in assistive devices is what we call the Midas touch problem. The Midas touch problem comes from the idea of uh, 
legendary King Midas, who wished that everything he turned, touched, turned into gold. And of course, he starved to death because his food and water would turn to gold. And that's the same thing. If I have an eye movement system that acts on everything that I'm looking at, I will have a lot of involuntary eye movements that will confuse what I'm doing. And so the question again is, can we decode the intention by just looking at large amounts of eye movement data? And so if you think about eye movements, you may see this beautiful picture by Ilya Repin, classic image for eye movements, and look at the scene. And a typical person will make an eye movement pattern that looks something like this. However, I can now modulate your eye movement pattern by giving you different tasks. I can ask you, how long has this man been away? How wealthy is this family? How old are the children? And each question I'm asking you gives you a different pattern of eye movement. This is well known. 50 years we know that. But what we don't have done, what we've not tried really yet so far is, if I know what you're doing and I have all your eye movements, can I guess what you're thinking based on the pattern of your eye movements? And so we did this for a very simple example. We did this for a wheelchair. So we asked people to sit in a wheelchair and drive with a joystick their wheelchair. And we did that in virtual reality. So that's my lab space. And we had them drive around our lab space. And they're using basically a joystick to drive and we measured their eye movements. So we correlated joystick command with eye movements. And then we took this data and inverted the mapping. So now we wanted to use eye movements to control the joystick. And this is how it looks like. So note, there's no user interface here. There's no interaction of the person with a computer. The person just looks out into the room and thinks what he wants to do. And it looks like in this case, when we're thinking about how to navigate through a room, our motor imagery triggers appropriate eye movements that our computer can decode. And it's a very low cognitive load task. So Kirobin, my student, is able to have a chat. Again, he's not looking at an interface. He's just looking and thinking about how he would like to walk. And he can navigate various things. So this is a simple example of using our data set of correlations of eye movements and body movements to predict future movements. So then we took it a bit further. Sorry, one second here. I just want to skip this. This is another slide that may make the computer crash. That's what I would like to try to avoid. But apparently the computer already crashed. There we are. So we took this to the next level and we simply asked people to paint all paintings with a brush and we recorded their eye movements. And we then tried to find a correlation between the structure of the eye movements and specific brush movements. And this is how it looks like. Ah. Oh. Sorry about that. So here you see an example of the same technology. So Sabine here is imagining she's painting the oil painting. And she's uh, we're using here remote eye tracker, so she's not wearing it. It sits here and looks at her. That's the eye tracker. She's sitting here. And she's just imagining how what she wants to paint. And with reasonable accuracy, she's actually able to paint the oil painting. And the robotic arm translates her actions into actual movements. And again, this is very low latency. And in con contrast to prosthetics or brain machine interfaces that decode neural activity, she doesn't have to think about rotate the arm, do this, do that, and each individual joint. She just thinks, I want to do this and her eyes generate appropriate eye movements, and these eye movements we decode from the correlation structure of eye movements. So what I've shown you are examples of how we can use this type of technology, exploiting the correlations in human behavior, our stereotypicity, which is ultimately the cause, or we believe is caused by the way our brain plans and structures movement, 
for restoration of human movement in augmentation, actually. Because effectively, we gave Sabine a third arm. And I can show you a different video where she's actually eating and drinking while painting. And that's completely possible. So the challenge, if you're thinking about brain-machine interfaces, is that they're very high cost and they have an aftercare if you need to do surgery. So this, is, this lady here uses uh, 256 electrode array implanted into her motor cortex operating in six degree of freedom arm, like our arm that I just showed you. And we can show you technology that can do that for a fraction of the price. We have a calibration procedure that takes roughly 60 seconds, not several hours as in the case of this lady. We are decoding roughly 50 bits per second. That means we can do continuous multi-joint movements. As you have seen in the brush drawing, she cannot. She's limited to 15 bits per second. She required six months of rehab before being able to do anything with the robot arm. Uh, Zabina sat in front of the system for roughly two minutes before she could start to draw. And we have a latency of roughly 10 to 12 milliseconds. And we believe that's actually very important if you look at questions of embodiment and making these devices more adop adopted by patients. Because that's one of the challenges that we see in prosthetics and in BMI is that people buy this technology, they use it for three to six months, and then they stop using it forever because they don't feel it's, it's useful. Okay. So let me take it a bit further, because really this is a cognitive sciences conference, so I showed, showed you something about cognition, not just about movement neuroscience. So I'm going back to my archaeology project. So this is in collaboration with Thierry Chaminat, who did the imaging, uh, Bruce Bradley, who is an, uh, an experimental archaeologist at Exeter University, and Dietrich Staud, who calls himself a neuroarchaeologist. And so what we really wanted to know is, what are the cognitive constraints that limited evolution of Flintstone tools? And what you observe is that there's this technology, roughly two and a half million years old, called Oldowan flint napping technology. And then you have the more modern Ashoelian and the most recent levallois type technology. And we wanted to know, why does it take us two million years to go from here to here? What limited the speed with which our ancestors could develop better technology? And I simplify this, I'm an engineer, apologies for that, but um, this is a whole you know, 20 years of debate. I'm simplifying it to these two things. So either it was that our hand, the mechanics of the hand, was not evolved enough, and we needed to develop new movements to go from here to here. Or maybe there was something about how we control and learn the complex, and I see here, cognitive structure of hand movements. And so we did the study, and I showed you at the start some, some videos of that. This was an early paper we did where we looked at differences in brain activation. And one of the striking differences we found is that there are areas, not just motor areas involved, but there are also difference in language areas that get activated when you make the more modern tools. And so here the, the concept of language appears again. And of course, if you think about human evolution, what really sets us apart is the ability to make tools and the ability to communicate with complex language. So is there a link maybe between the two? So the first study that we did was simply to measure the finger and hand movements that you do when you reproduce the Oldowan technology versus the Ashwellian technology. And just to keep it short, this was a paper five years ago, we demonstrated that the movements of the fingers and the shape and the words of movements of the hand that you're using are the same for both technologies. So if you have modern man replicating that, they don't do any different movements. The only difference that we found was something in the structure of these movements. Now let me explain me how we get there. So if you look at hand movements, you can look at the movements of unscrewing a bottle as a continuous waving motion of all your 20 finger joints. Now I told you already that we have a technology that allows us to go from these continuous motions into symbolic code, symbols of motion, words of motion. And in this case here, I've just given them a human interpretation. So one is the grab, then there's an unscrew, 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 then you pour it, and then you put it down. So I've not annotated that. There's no anthropomorphic interpretation here. That's simply what my algorithm spits out from the structure of the data. 
But what you observe here is that depending on the type of bottle that you operate, a jar or a bottle like here, there's a certain invariance in the structure. You will always need to grab the thing. You may then have to do an arbitrary number of unscrew motions, depending whether the lid is like this or like this. Then you do something else with it, and then you release it at some point. So there's an invariant higher order structure to these movements. And if you can think about that, there's also structure and language, and we all know that as grammar. So the cat ate a mouse gives you a specific set of rules that linguists have, of course, defined as noun, verbs, and so forth, and how they're interrelated. If you think about behavior, most of our behavior is also governed by rules. So to brush my teeth, I need first to open my mouth, then I need to brush, and then I need to close my mouth, right? And I can do that like in the bathroom or while I'm taking a shower. But independent of the context I'm doing is this pattern just repeats somewhere else, and this structure is maintained. And so this structure looks like language. It's a symbolic structure that always repeats. And now imagine you're an alien who comes from another planet and looks at human language text. The alien will not know what you're talking about, but what the alien can detect is that there are specific rules that certain type of words, we call verbs, always reappear in a certain position in relation to other words. So we don't have aliens to ask, but we have computer linguistic algorithms that we can run. So we have a symbolic string of actions, and we run computer algorithms asking them, find a grammar that explains this behavior. So basically what we're doing is we have this continuous string of, of actions, and our computer finds symbols, and then after it has found these symbols, it finds rules that are invariant across people and across repeated trials. We call this action grammars. And I'm just showing you two quick examples. So this is an old dough and flake. So this is the two and a half year old technology. And you find a specific set of symbols that I've given here human annotation uh, that occur throughout time. And then our rule system finds that there's a first level of hierarchy of rules that describe transition between what the computer identified to be four set of higher order rules. And then the system finds, I asked them, is there a hierarchical structure in here? And the system says, yes. There are two more states, two more higher order structures. But for this Odoan technology, this sits simply all the time up here. Again, no human interpretation here. I, the computer does not know what I'm doing here. No human knowledge injected. This is just data driven. And we can then do the same thing for the more modern technology. And now you can see how these two higher order states are used more in a more engaged manner than these four lower order states that the system found. So this is one way of looking at the data. Another way is ask the computer to convert these strings, the sequences, into grammatical rules like we may actually encounter in our school books. And so this is what we call a context-free grammar. It's a specific type of formal language. And the structure of the behavior looks like this, that at the start, when you're making a tool, you do something that we call primary action. The primary action is composed out of three other actions, which means that you can do this action and do this action arbitrary numbers of times and continue, or you do this action and then you do this a number of times. And this you can repeat a number of times and then you can skip and finish, or you can go through the secondary action and that has also certain structure. So we call these railroad diagrams because they easily allow us to understand how things are structured. So we can extract these with the computer and basically, what we think we've found is a way of going from continuous behavior, unconstrained behavior, looking at the raw data, finding a symbolic structure, inferring grammatical rules, and now being able to predict differences in brain activation that are related to, in this case, actually Broca's area, which is an area that processes grammar, with the structure and hierarchical structure necessary for generating complex behavior. And so this leads me to a very speculative statement. If you are familiar with formal linguistics or computer science, you will know that Noam Chomsky in the 50s defined a hierarchical level of different complexities of grammars. And his idea was that there are different levels, so-called linear grammars, context-free grammars, context-sensitive grammars, and that human language sits somewhere up, up there. This relates back to discussions about whether grammars are innate in the human mind or not. 
I can't comment on that. But what I can comment on is if we do this high throughput data analysis, that for the older technology, we find grammars that are more simple, the Oldowan grammars, than the Australian grammars. And what I've not told you is, sorry, that if you're making Australian technology, you have two stages in the grammar, while if you're making Oldowan, uh, you just need this structure here and you skip this secondary part here. So the more modern tool is a superset of the grammar of the older tool. And so this leads us to speculate whether the hierarchical structure and the composition of hierarchical structure constrained not just our evolution of language, but also our evolution to ability to produce complex tools. Okay. So coming to an end, what I've shown you is a very different take on how one can do science. Not do science in the lab, but do science in the wild with unconstrained settings where you have to study natural behavior. I've shown you how, although this is purely descriptive science, if it's purely data driven, we can make very strong quantitative predictions. These are testable theories. We may not understand the theory, but we can test the theory. The understanding of the theory is whatever the computer extracted as sort of structure. And we can derive technology from that. And really coming to an end, what I basically want to, to remind you is that when people go and study eye movements or schizophrenia or, you know, how you move your joints in your knees, then we're not looking nature in this way. We're really looking nature in this way. And I think what we really need to think more about now that we have the capability to deal with large amounts of data is how we can put this back together in this. And so I just want to thank, first of all, the master students that came through our lab. You can imagine uh, we required a lot of manpower to do this work. Uh, some of them are here. And then this is the lab team member, postdocs and PhDs. And these kind institutions gave us money to do all this research. Thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to questions. We have around 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Those on the balcony, I'm very sorry, but you might have to come down for the questions. So. Thank you for your talk. Uh, what kind of uh, motor behavior would not be, would not have any grammar in it? So the question is, what kind of behavior does not have a grammatical structure? Right. Um, that's difficult to say. Um, so purely random behavior, if you could generate random behavior, would so have no walk, structure. Walking has a grammar in it? Sorry? Walking? Yes, a very simple grammar. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Yeah, it's very easy. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Hi. Um, so if, if my understanding is, is correct, uh, basically you said that um, the, the linguistic structure somehow unleashed the technological lift? It's a hypothesis. It's <laughs> okay, so just to simplify, and do you think that uh, it also works the other way around, which means technology might um, unleash a new forms of uh, linguistic structure and communications? That's a very interesting question. Um, it's, 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 it's very difficult. Um, it's it's a, a lot of fun to work with archaeologists. They have fantastic questions. But it's, of course, very difficult to have precise causal relationships. And I, all I can say is that they're strongly co-evolved. That's my assumption. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Uh, we've got a, a website with a shop where we can buy your cheap equipment. 
Uh, no, but we're happy to collaborate. Okay. <laughs> I, I will be interested in such equipment. Thank you. Um, you said at the beginning that uh, without movement, there is no evolution. Does it mean that um, evolution, evolution requires some sort of uh, loop to validate a movement done? Okay, so let me, pre make, let me be more precise. So, for evolution to act, you need to experience selective pressure. You need to survive and reproduce or not survive and not reproduce. The most immediate thing that is affected by that is your behavior the movements that you make. And when I talk to you, I'm also making movements in my vocal cords. So, in that sense, you cannot have evolution without some form of behavior. Yeah? Remember, bacteria also move. They don't have brains, but they definitely move. And so, of course, plants don't move, but the idea is, of course, that there's a benefit to being able to move. And that was a selective advantage, right? So from then, once you start moving, it's obvious that you need a brain to make better movements in the future. And at some point, the movements become so complex that you need to, you know, have abstractions and maybe even symbolic abstractions. Um, you said you could... Uh, Um, you said you could eat with um, the technology of, um, with, of regarding the food, but how can you adjust the, um, the velocity of the movement by, by just your eye movement? Uh -huh. So there's a beautiful result by Reza Shatmer and John Hopkins, and they found that the vigor of the eye movement, i.e. the speed, is highly correlated with reward. So if you really want something, you look at it quicker. So you could adjust the speed with that. But uh, let me say, once you have robots, and the robots that we're having are very powerful, they can, uh, they can kill you if they do the wrong thing, you have to be a lot more careful, right? And remember, this is technology we develop for paralyzed people and amputees who, who cannot run away, okay? So we have some, there's safety consider considerations uh, beyond the, the free speed control. Thank you. Can you? Thank you for the talk. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Where are you? I'm here. Ah, hi. <laughs> okay. Thank you um, very much. I was wondering about the Human Ethome project, where you studied all the movements of the people. Um, why that specific environment of the office and the bedroom and the? Was it because it was more practical? Or was it the most representative of daily life? You thought or? Okay. Great question. So. We have to be very specific, right? So the, the population, the 60 people we scanned are students of Imperial College, so they do very specific tasks. And we needed a home environment because all the assistive t robotic technology is most important to help people in the home, to, re to make them more independent. Um, there are other studies we're doing where you, know, you go out, but at the moment, if you run around with a backpack and a lot of strange cable, not a good idea, yeah? <laughs> so we're waiting with that a bit. Uh, hi. Uh, what does the, the baseline activity in the brain uh, represent? Great question. Uh, I have my guesses. I, I can't answer it out of this study. But what we strongly believe is um, that baseline activity reflects something about your prior assumptions about the world. So the fact, the fact that you're moving certain joints in a correlation structure and that's reflected in your brain activity means that probably if you're without sensory inputs, your brain recapitulates something about the type of dynamics it's most likely expecting to experience. That's a guess. But that's not what I'm really working on. Um, thank you for your talk. I, I was here. 
Um, did you study also uh, the relation between the high movement and how people um, learn and memorize? And um, especially using mostly which uh, sense, like vision or ears or, or whatever. And how, wh what is mostly invariant between different people and what is very specific? Okay, so your question is a question how we use the hands to memorize things. No, no, how the eyes movement? Yeah. What does it tell us about um, the memory mechanism ah, and the okay. learning mechanism? I'm sorry, I understand. In terms of storage of information, in terms of access to information, okay, so in terms of building a representation of the world. Okay. And yeah, so at the moment we have one project that's, that's not an unconstrained project, that's not wild, that's a highly psychophysical designed experiment uh, where we are testing whether we can detect whether we're recalling an image or not based on arbitrary images. And, um, and for that we basically take the raw eye movement data and let it run to a computer algorithm to extract some pattern. And we're getting, preliminarily speaking, some good predictive results. Where predictive results means it's better than chance. It's not amazing. Yeah? But there is information in the structure and the eye movements that tells us when you're trying to recall something. And it's not this classic thing that you look top right that they always use in the thrillers. Uh, that's not it. Yes, hello, thanks. This was really great. Uh, I was wondering as well if this eye tracking analysis could bring to predicting uh, other types of uh, not only m movement, you know, just for example, I don't know, uh, social interactions or m longer term objectives or stuff like this. Yeah, um, that's something I'm very keen on. And so the reason why we dropped the price, uh, we developed technology to reduce the price is because we really would like to have, you know, 30 people living in a village and we measure everything that they're doing and then we can, should be able to extract social interactions, yeah. That's, give me 10 years, but we'll get there. <laughs> Thank you for your great talk. Um, this technology looks really amazing. Um, I have a suggestion to make it uh, even simpler. Try and, uh, can, you, can you try and do some studies with uh, animals like monkeys or... <laughs> would you be able to, uh, to, 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 to use uh, this kind of devices in the, in, with okay. animals and, and what would be the perspectives of that in terms of uh, uh, basic science? For so I think, personally, I think animal experiments are very important especially in non-human primates, uh, because we need to know something about the neural activity going on in our brain. And spikes are the ultimate language of the brain. Um, there are, I think, two challenges. In England, you can't really do animal experiments properly anymore. And the other thing is, the reason why we can drop the prices on all this technology is because we're using, up using some mass market solution for normal human people. And so it's a lot easier to put stuff and sensors on humans than on a monkey, for example. So it, for me, it's easier. If people want to adopt our technology for animals, I'm very happy to talk about it. So last question. Okay, no last question then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>